Senator Allen. Um, okay, a couple of things that kind of struck my interest. Um, the first one had to do with the habitat impacts that were brought up in, as part of the early report. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the extent to which your agencies work with the Department of Fish and Wildlife to assess and you know, mitigate the types of, uh, these types of habitat impacts that may, may relate to, to oil extraction? Well, this falls primarily in the jurisdiction of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And so whenever, you know, they, there's a project and it has impacts to wildlife, uh, and particularly if it's endangered species, they have to get a permit uh, from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So um, very often, you know, there's other permits going on besides the permits that we issue uh, that have to do with habitat. Some of these areas, for example, there's conservation plans. Uh, some of these activities have been going on for a very, very long time. And, and you, know, uh, you know, originally when the projects first started, there were, you know, habitat mitigation measures. So that is, you know, it's not, it's primarily not under our department to do the habitat uh, permit or mitigation. So who, who works on that? Uh, the, the operator has to go to the Department of Fish and Wildlife and get a permit uh, under them when they just, you know, if they're going to disturb habitat, particularly if it's, uh, um, you know, affecting habitat that affects endangered species. Of course, that would also be the jurisdiction of a, a local locality, uh, the county um, that they have to go get land use permits from, uh, a, a county would be well within its jurisdiction to require mitigations um, and even prohibitions on land uses associated with oil and gas development. Yeah, it, just, it's, it seems like this may be an area where there's inadequate regulation or government protection in place. Um, that's because really, I'm, I'm not sure that the- it, Yeah, that's really clear from the report. It, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so something for us to be thinking about. Um, now on the pits, you know, you mentioned that you're, you're witnessing the stimulation um, are, are you also witnessing disposal and, and the water disposal? Uh, I mean, are you, you know, are you certain that the pits are, are not being used? I mean, if if so, you know, you you know, how are you? So operators are required to have a fluid management plan, and so we are monitoring and verifying the, that those fluids are managed in the way that they're they're required by regulation and and in, in accordance with the plan. Okay. I mean, I guess, uh, yeah. Let me just follow up on that one to to, this, to Mr. Bishop. How, I mean, how confident are you that produced water from um, hydro hydraulically fractured wells is not in Class Two wells under U.S. APA review? So uh, I'm I'm pretty confident that um, that wells that are for, um, that are stimulated today that they're managing their flow back water. Um, in accordance to the regulation, there's a lot of oversight today. Um, am I confident that wells that were stimulated um, 10 years ago that their um, that their produced water from those wells are not going to um, ponds? No, I'm not. I have no confidence on that. But I also um, recognize that the that we produce a large volume of water that's from the um, Reservoir. It's, this is water that's naturally associated with the oil, and that's what what we're mostly getting. In, that's what we're getting in these produced wells. So there's a time frame factor that becomes the closer you are, the much more comfortable um, I am because we have good regulations and oversight today. We didn't have that same level of oversight two years ago, five years ago, and so the wells that were stimulated then. Um, did water from them get into percolation ponds? I think that there's potentially that they did. Okay. Continue. I, I just wanted to put that into your line as a help. No, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. Um, uh, okay. Well, so I guess this is the last thing. I know we're crunched for time a little bit, but uh, you know, we have been talking a lot about this reuse of produced water, and I just wanted to, you know, the, the LA Times had a story about this issue, and I, I just wanted to get a sense of what level of testing is currently required. Um, before. So every uh, so the testing that's required is um, all the material that um, that is required for monitoring under SP4 is required for um, water that's going to be discharged to the surface or reused at the surface, um, and that includes the requirement that they test for anything that um, that they put into it, not just in terms of um, in hydraulic stimulation, but if they use anything to help them extract the oil out of the water, some, uh, any chemical processes that they're monitoring for that information also. Okay. That, that's too much. Okay. 
Okay. Any other questions from the committee? I, I do, I mean, so that's so, sort of an answer to, to the question that I had, which is, uh, you know, as you have heard in this report, they have said that there are likely uh, fracking chemicals because there were fracking fluids um, uh, in um, some of these improperly uh, permitted uh, underground injection um, wells that were connected to beneficial use. Uh, so what is the state, do you, do you believe that that is likely? Um, what is your reaction in terms of action that the state board is going to take? So we're taking two actions related to that. One is that we, um, under this year's, um, I, I believe it was trailer bill language that um, requires us now to um, concur with any aquifer exemptions or with any um, underground injection projects that are proposed um, to, the, to the division. So we are actively reviewing and in, engaged in all underground injection pr um, proposals that go on. Um, we are also um, cognizant, so that's moving forward. Um, we're also very cognizant of the, um, the potential that activities, well stimulation, uh, injection, improper injection, improper disposal at the surface, leaks, spills, activities um, could have uh, impacted groundwater. So our regional monitoring program that was authorized under SB4 is focused on the idea of understanding what's happened in the groundwater um, nearby and co-located with oil fields. Very little information is available today on that because you can imagine people are, um, the for the most part, this is the area of which are not being used. The groundwater in that area isn't being used. We don't have a lot of information on it. So we're looking at that information outside our regional monitoring. And then I'd like to make one more quick point, which is that um, we have been working closely with the division and US EPA on um, evaluating and, and requiring information from operators on wells that um, are discharging improperly that were um, to areas that didn't have an exemption and rec making recommendations which the division has followed up on and on um, shutting in wells that are um, discharging improperly that might have an impact on beneficial use and working towards either getting an aquifer exemption where it's appropriate, where the, the discharge is either into a, a, a highly saline water or into an oil field reservoir that's already got oil field material in it or getting them shut down. And then to follow up on, on Senator Allen's uh, question. So you, so you said the same regs, uh, same SB4 regs apply to uh, application of uh, fracking water or oil um, or water used in these extraction operations um, for ag or other beneficial use. But what does that, what does that really mean? My, my, that means disclosure of the, of the chemicals that might be in the water, but if we don't completely understand what some of the effects are of the chemicals because they have only been recently and incompletely dis disclosed, how much of a, that of a protection is that really if this could be used in water for, you know, watering our, our agricultural uh, fields? So we've got a couple of things going on there. First, um, um, all the, the water that is used for um, beneficial reuse, it's a small amount now, but as they mentioned, but might get bigger, um, has to have a permit. And that permit um, sets limits on um, constituents of, that can be in the water and requires monitoring for many more constituents. Um, there is always a question, and I, I recognize it is a uh, question and concern that there are, um, there are chemicals in um, in the produced water, there's chemicals actually in our surface water and in our groundwater that we use for, for all beneficial uses that we don't have complete information. We call those chemicals of emerging concern. They're chemicals that we don't have regulatory thresholds for. Um, and so we have a, uh, a actually a, uh, a 
process that was put together by a scientific panel to look at different chemicals of emerging concern and rank their um, concern, as you would say, and to see about do we need to provide more regulatory um, um, action on them. So that's that, that's that's that, I think that's the crux of what I, what I want to get at is in the face of dwindling dwindling water resources. Obviously, a part of us wants to reuse water, um, uh, but the combination of of the possible dangers of of using water used in fracking operations for agricultural use and simply the the issue of in underground injection control and how much migrates off site both call into question safety of our water supplies what um, in a follow up to this report and in other information uh, of the of the myriad events and mishaps of the last year um, what policy recommendations um, do you believe are needed to protect the safety of our water supplies um, on this given issue? Sure. So um, there are a couple of things that are ongoing, and then there are a couple of things that um, that seem to make sense as we move forward. Um, it's really important for us to um, to recognize that there is oil and gas production is going to produce a large volume of produced water that needs to be disposed of. And the, there are three disposal methods that really are available to us. Um, there is deep well injection, um, which as you mentioned, there have been um, issues with that and we're working with the division and with US EPA to correct some of those issues, but that is a, um, that's one area. The second area is, um, is um, disposal at the surface, um, ponds, those kind of things. Those, um, as I said earlier, that those should be done in a way that you monitor and treat so that it meets all the beneficial uses for the groundwater. That should be a, <coughs> a priority. Um, and then the third is um, direct reuse of that, which would clearly need to meet um, uh, requirements also for that reuse. So we're making sure that the water from um, oil fields, which is not the fracking water. We, we talked about that is no longer allowed to be commingled and discharged in the same way. It has to be managed. But the produced water itself has hydrocarbons in it or they wouldn't have produced it. Um, they take that out for oil. It's got um, salts and other um, minerals in it. Um, needs to be um, monitored and um, it needs to be treated when, when, it, when treatment is necessary for um, reuse. So you think that that percolation ponds should still be part of that suite of options, even when other states have phased them out? Well, I, I think other states are in a different situation than we are in terms of um, scarcity of water. I think that um, it is um, it is important for us to recognize that um, water can be treated um, for use. We do this with wastewater. We do this with other industrial waters. We ought to be looking at it as a um, as a potential resource and requiring the level of treatment necessary to make it usable, as opposed to just taking as the first recourse to dispose of it into deep well injection, which takes it out of the hydrologic cycle and is no longer available. So you're saying that in, instead of phasing out percolation ponds, we should be we should be requiring treatment and then allowing percolation ponds of treated water or other beneficial use of treated water. Right, and, and treatment is, um, you know, I, I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, that every instance you have to treat because there may be instances where the water is of sufficient quality at, at the time without treatment, but I don't, I think it's a case by case that you need to make sure that it's meeting all of the um, um, beneficial use, which include uh, agriculture, human health, aquatic life, these are, um, strict standards that should be adhered to. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Uh, we will do public comment. Um, uh, we, uh, members of the public are welcome to provide their input at the hearing to the committee. Um, time is very limited, um, so written comments may be provided to uh, the committee staff and will be accepted through the end of the week and these, those comments will be part of the public record of the hearing and will be posted online. Um, brevity is incre in 
is very, very important. We will uh, hold people to a one to two minute um, time period. Um, we hope you will choose more towards the one um, uh, because I wanna make sure that the legislators hear what you have to say. Um, so uh, anyone can come up to the center mic and provide public comment. Um, I took uh, a little bit of offense to the answer that was given to Mr. Williams when he asked about reinjecting fluids down. Uh, he said it's an oil reservoir, therefore it holds things. Well, there's a difference in viscosity between oil and other fluids. Uh, also, part of uh, geologic understanding is that those wells didn't form the oil, the oil de uh, developed elsewhere and went down into those wells. So if it went down, there has, has to be ways of going out. And that's the end of my comment, thank you. Thank you. And I forgot to say that, uh, please state your name for your record, the record, and, but you already did, so. Bill? I'm Bill Alio for the Environmental Working Group. Um, maybe just provide some perspective here. In 2011, uh, Docker had databases that were not searchable and incomplete. There was no regulation of fracking, and in fact, they inf inf infamously claimed fracking wasn't even occurring. Uh, there was a critical report by USP on the underground injection control, which was basically ignored for a while. Oil companies said there was no evidence of harm, so what's the problem, yet we were not doing any monitoring. DOGGER was an unknown acronym in this building, and now everyone talks about it. They were a captured agency that did what the oil companies needed to get done and did not answer to the public or the legislature. No one asked them to either. Um, there was a memorandum of understanding between the water board and DOGGER that was just a piece of paper. Today, we have science coming in, thankfully to the leadership of Senator Pavley and SB4. We have information that's coming in. We have new aggressive management that I think that understands the need for reform. Regulations are in place, so we now know what's going on. And yet we still have wastewater being disposed of in the cheapest possible way, which is open pits, which is not just a groundwater problem, but an air quality impact in the, one of the worst air basins in the United States. And we um, have toxic chemicals still in use, so there's still a lot to go, but I wanted to say the cup is half full, and I'm kind of a half-empty cup guy. So there's some positive stuff there, thanks. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good afternoon, or good morning. Uh, my name is David Braun. I'm with Californians Against Fracking. Uh, thank you so much for holding this hearing. Um, just want to call attention that we did an analysis and actually with um, members, Californians Against Fracking is a coalition of over 200 organizations that stand for a ban on fracking. Some of our member groups uh, that are actually here and will be testifying um, facilitated or assisted in doing research and actually going through the CCST report. Out of the CCST report, we produced a top 10 reasons to ban fracking, uh, utilizing actually all of the language that was used in the CCST report. This is not hyperbole. Uh, this is actually what uh, appeared in the report uh, and ranges uh, things from that we have evidence that earthquakes are already being caused uh, by fracking uh, or waste well injection here in California to uh, fracking threatening our groundwater, um, the ty types of toxic chemicals. Um, 17 of the chemicals used are among the um, most toxic chemicals known to man or to humankind. Um, there is some really frightening stuff. Um, human beings are not lab rats, but the way this process is continuing is that they are being treated as if they were. So um, we're calling for a ban, um, or at the very least, a uh, immediate halt on fracking so that human beings are not being treated as lab rats. Um, we should follow the path of New York. We should have a health study done by the Department of Health. That's their job. Uh, they've indicated they would actually like to do that, to actually investigate this so that we can better understand this and we uh, feel confident that fracking would be banned here in California as it was in New York State by the health department were that to happen. Thank you so much again for holding this. Thank you. And I'm amazed everyone's been under two minutes thus far. That's great. 
Thank you, uh, Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Andrew Grinberg. I'm the Oil and Gas Program Manager with Clean Water Action. Uh, I want to commend the authors of this report for taking on a very large uh, task and executing it impressively. I, I think the biggest overarching theme here is that the impacts that they found, both direct and indirect, from fracking and other well stimulation, also applies to many other forms of oil and gas production. And you know, take the example of uh, dumping into open pits. Um, whether or not a well was fracked, there are likely harmful chemicals in produced water, and that's whether they were introduced in routine well cleanouts, enhanced oil recovery operations, or just the naturally occurring chemicals in produced water. And so I just want to clarify the recommendation as I read it from the executive summary, which is that CCST recommends prohibiting disposal into unlined piss, pits unless the presence of harmful chemicals can be ruled out and they've emphasized from any phase of oil and gas production. So I think we got into a discussion today that got very narrowed on fracking and um, the, the recommendation goes much more broadly than that. And uh, we do have a bill, uh, Senate Bill 248, which would achieve uh, such a goal as well as a number of other recommendations of this report, um, including getting at some of the chemical issues, um, addressing shallow fracking, and um, you know, in general, there are clear paths forward being outlined in this report um, and legislative proposals to take them on. So uh, I encourage you, everyone to take a look at those proposals if you haven't already voted on them. Um, and in general, this report does point to the huge data gaps and risks that are both known and unknown that should call for an immediate moratorium on fracking um, based on the science. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Hartmeyer. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work at the University of California, San Francisco, and I'm here representing the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. I'm extremely concerned about the chemicals that are being used, and some of my comments are really echo what has been brought up today, is that what are the health effects of these chemicals on individuals and on communities? And I really feel strongly that we cannot adequately or timely um, assess the interactions of these chemicals uh, with one another on people's health and in the community. And therefore, I am uh, in support of an immediate ban on fracking um, in California. I'm afraid that we are repeating history with some of the other chemicals that we have experienced in the United States, and we are not going to see the effects of these chemicals until much later on future generations, and we're unfortunately going to um, experience that. So I, I support an immediate ban. Thank you very much.